Mark Moss, founder of Market Disruptors and nationally syndicated radio host. Welcome to Real Vision. Yeah, thanks so much, Ash. I'm so excited to be here today. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. We were talking a little bit offline uh, about your background. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be where you are today. Wow, man, the the super high level view is um, I, I got I got uh, I got lucky. I had good friends. I had a good network. And when I was 18 years old, um, I started buying uh, foreclosed homes from the banks, fixing them up and selling them at 18. I didn't know anything about it, but my friend did. And uh, that became the life of an investor slash entrepreneur, went on to fix and flip over 150 homes, developed $25 million in real estate, had multiple businesses. I started uh, investing into these crazy things called uh, internet stocks in the late 90s. My roommate quit his job and we're like day trading these like internet stock things. After the dot-com boom uh, and then the dot-com crash in 2001, I had this bright, bright idea that I would start an e-commerce business, which wasn't easy at the time. Um, I spent all this money, built this website, and I went and I tried to get brands to let me sell their products on my website. And they laughed at me and told me nobody would ever buy anything online. That was ridiculous. Uh, so I've lived through that. Um, I ended up building up an e-commerce business. I have a Fortune 500 exit there. Um, and so I've just kind of been this entrepreneur investor. Um, in 2008, I got my butt kicked in the great financial crash. Um, I forgot. I didn't. I guess I didn't understand one of the main rules of investing, which is it's probably not a good idea to have all your money into one single asset class, which is Southern California real estate, which I did. Um, and then that caused me to go, wait a minute, like I'm really good at making money, but what the heck is this financial system that I haven't quite figured out? And so I started learning more about you know the Federal Reserve and the way the financial system works. Um, I kind of became a gold bug. I figured sound money was the way to go. And as I started uh, moving along with this gold bug, I started kind of really – uh, pursuing this kind of freedom mindset. I kind of learned like, just like I didn't want all my money into one stock or one asset class, why do I want my whole life into one country, right? And so then I started thinking about you know international diversification. I was in the process in 2015 of setting up a offshore trust and bank account in Panama so I could start to work on residency and a passport eventually. Um, and I took another look at Bitcoin, and I said, wow, it's actually, it's the same thing. It's a way for me to get my money out of the banking system. And so I just bought Bitcoin instead. Um, and once I started to learn more about it, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, this is the tool that we have. Like, we, we finally have a chance to win now. And we can do this. And so at that point, I decided I have to tell everybody I know about it. And so I have. And so I started writing <clears throat> from 2016 to 2019. I wrote maybe arguably one of the biggest cryptocurrency research newsletters that was out there for, for four years, published over a thousand pages of research. Um, and uh, I've just been talking about it ever since now on YouTube, uh, now on iHeartRadio and, uh, and here with you today. You said something to me off camera that I thought was very insightful and a statement that I definitely agree with this notion that solutions come from problems. In your view, Mark, tell us what are the problems we face today? Yeah, that's that's such a great that's such such a great point. I mean, solutions are supposed to come to problems today with the Federal Reserve printing, you know, trillions of dollars, we have money trying to find solutions that don't need to be solved. But I would say if we really take a step back, I think it's really simple. There's just really one main problem, and I would say that one main problem is uh, endless money supply. Um, it's it's the money printer. And I think I look at it like um, if we had like this giant oak tree with like 10,000 leaves and every leaf on that tree is a problem. So, you know, income inequality or supply chains breaking down or uh, censorship, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's a lots of problems up there, obviously. At the base of that tree, at the root, I think it all is the money printer. And so uh, money is supposed to be communication and that communication helps to coordinate the world helps to coordinate economies. And when you just continue to print more of it, it distorts everything and every area of life becomes distorted um, and causes uh, all these problems. So that endless money printer is a big problem. And regardless of where you sit on a lot of these issues that are that are hot today, um, you know, pro or pro or con mandates or pro or con lockdowns or pro whatever it may be, it's all because of the money printer. If they didn't have the money printer, we wouldn't have those problems. We wouldn't have people um, getting paid not to work. And then we have supply chain issues because of it. And so it all trickles down to that. So that's a big problem. I would say another big problem that we have today is censorship. And not just censorship in the ability to not say what I want on Facebook or YouTube, um, even censorship in my ability to hold my own wealth. And so uh, right now I can hold my money in the bank in dollars. Um, 
But then the central bank can create more of those dollars, which is then stealing the value from my money. But even more importantly, they can censor the way I can use that money or spend that money. So a good example is just recently, I think about a month ago, uh, PayPal teamed up with the Anti-Defamation League. And the Anti-Defamation League was going to put out a list of all the people they thought shouldn't get funding. I don't know why they get to choose, but they did. And so PayPal is going to block all transactions to those people. Now they're going to share that list with other people. So I'm, I'm censored in even my ability to use my money if I want to support you know, a candidate that they deem not, uh, not to be good. Uh, and then the third biggest problem that I think we have today, which again, all goes back to the money printer. Um, but we've gone from a system uh, of ruled by law. So the constitution of the United States was a, was a, a rule of law that's supposed to be pretty easy to understand. And so that everybody understands the law. And more importantly, it's supposed to be set in stone. And the reason why is because then I can plan my life based off of those laws and you can plan your life based off those laws. But today we're not ruled by law, we're ruled by men who are constantly changing the rules on us all the time. And literally, uh, we were talking offline, like I'm, I'm in Puerto Rico right now. I was thinking about going back to California where I'm from, but like, I literally don't know what Gavin Newsom will have the laws be next month. I literally don't know that. Uh, my sister is a ER doctor and she was forced out of her job there a few weeks ago. So she was working on setting up a private practice um, but now they changed the laws there and now she can't set up a private practice. So she's like, well, I, what state should I move to? I don't know what the laws are going to be next month. And so uh, the world can't work like that. Uh, the world requires long-term decisions, long-term capital deployment. Um, and so those are three really big problems that I see in the world today. Yeah. And you also mentioned, we've been talking about this offline. It's something that if people follow your YouTube channel or your radio show, uh, you talk about a lot, uh, which is this notion of cyclicality as you see it. Uh, you see these changing cycles. Give us a little bit of a sketch of what that means to you. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, going back to school, like my favorite subject was history. And so I just, I love looking at history. And I think that um, history is so important to understand how we got to where we are today. Uh, but I also believe that it can also help us to understand kind of what that, what the future holds. And so I've done a lot of work on cycles um, and there's cycles, uh, all different size cycles and all different types of markets. Um, and when you're looking at any market, if you're looking at, you know, the financial market, for example, you're using different indicators to try to understand what could happen. Hopefully they're, they're leading indicators. And the, the thing with indicators is, you know, they can be good, but they're not, you know, that powerful, especially when you're just looking at one or two. And so you're trying to look at multiple indicators um, to get a better picture. And so when you start looking at these cycles, you need to start looking at them from different areas of the world. And I think that's kind of what helps, you know, humans think that progress is like linear, um, one step, and maybe linear goes up a little bit, but really progress is exponential. But while progress is happening exponentially, things are then repeating. And so um, this big thesis that I've kind of been talking about and put together basically looks at like these political, social, cultural cycles, how they just continually repeat. Um, then there's um, those work on like a 250 year time frame. Um, then we have uh, technological revolution cycles that work on about a 50-year time frame. And I'm not talking about new technologies like an iPhone or Uber. I'm talking about technological revolutions that change humanity. Um, and then we have like a financial revolution cycle that works on like an 80-year time frame. And what's interesting is right now we're at a point in history where all three of those happen to be converging at the same time. And I think it's important to understand that because uh, it's pretty easy to look at the financial markets, which most of us are focused on, and we can see that they're ready for a reset. So, um, you know, interest rates are at zero or negative in most parts of the world. Debts are at, you know, astronomical heights. Um, where do you go, right? Uh, we can see that uh, kind of like, uh, like a board game, if we were out of moves, what comes next? You have to reset the game. And so we can see uh, on an 80 year time frame, 80 years ago, we had the Bretton Woods Agreement. So the whole world went on to a gold standard, right? Uh, based off the dollar. Um, and today, 80 years later, we have the IMF is calling for a Bretton Woods II. Okay, so we can see that. Um, and so a lot of people are speculating, you know, will the dollar die? Will the dollar remain res reserve currency? Uh, will China take over? Could it be the yuan or could it be a digital yuan? Could it be an SDR basket? Could, it, could we go back to gold, right? And so there's all these, these things thrown around. And I think um, if you only look at the financial piece, you could get lost in trying to figure that out. But if you understand the other two cycles, I think it becomes a lot more clear. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more 
only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.